Uh, let's get started. So, you know, thanks for coming on. We're talking welfare today. Um, and we're uh, going to just, I guess we're going to outline our, our ideologies and get into it. It's not a very formal, structured conversation, more of a podcast style discussion. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll start my... My general philosophy with regards to welfare is that we need it. It's good. Uh, the government has a, a, a strong, uh, to me, a moral role and an empirical uh, sort of positive role in establishing a, a welfare state for people. And that, that welfare state, to me, has been shown to alleviate to an incredible degree uh, extreme poverty in the countries where welfare states have been implemented. Now, uh, of course, we have to talk about what we define as welfare. To me, I define welfare as pretty much any cash or non-cash benefit that goes to people uh, with some sort of, you know, qualification, right? So I would include health care programs, social security, um, food stamps, unemployment insurance. These are all welfare programs. Um, yeah. And uh, so that's uh, my thought. YouTube, I, I see. So you and you, that's you're streaming YouTube. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. All right. So you guys that, should be able to hear me now. There's no conversation going on on Discord, is there? I mean, other than us. No, no. It's just us, and it's streamed on different, different, uh, uh, different platforms. All right. You guys should be able to hear me now. But all right. So now that we've figured that out, my goodness. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so I would define those as forms of welfare. I think they're good things, uh, and I think that in an American context, we could stand to expand those forms of welfare to some great degree. Uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I take uh, very much the opposite view. Uh, uh, I, uh, I think a uh, welfare state is inherently immoral and inherently uh, uh, disastrous, uh, primarily to the people who um, who it supposedly is helping out? That is the 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 poor and the the extremely poor. I don't think the welfare state has brought anybody out of extreme poverty. Um, I think extreme poverty uh, people have been brought out of extreme poverty. Uh, the economy is brought. Economic growth brings people out of extreme poverty. It's only um, relatively wealthy countries uh, after they've grown because of relatively free markets that can even afford a welfare state. Um, but uh, the actual gaining, out, getting out of extreme poverty is a feature of uh, free markets, not a feature of the welfare state. Um, but, but more importantly, I think it's immoral. I think it's immoral for two reasons. One is, uh, I think it is immoral for the state to use coercion to take my money for any purpose, um, and certainly for purposes that have, um, that basically reallocate it to other people. That is, I think it is wrong for other people to gain benefit to coercion uh, from from my income, um, and it it is a violation of what I think this role of the state is, which is to protect my freedoms, to protect me, not to violate my freedoms, not to uh, coerce me. Uh, so I think it is a politically a negation of the fundamental role of the state, uh, and economically, I think it is. Uh, so one oh one more aspect morally, and then I'll go to economically. And finally, morally, I think it provides perverse incentives uh, to poor people. I think it, um, it basically institutionalizes people into poverty, uh, and uh, it, it uh, reduces ambition. Uh, it reduces the things that make kind of a flourishing, successful, prosperous, long-term life um, you know, really exciting and, and kind of worth living. So it hurts the people it purports to help. Uh, among other things, it does that by, and this is my economic critique of the welfare state, uh, welfare states uh, suppress wealth creation, they suppress economic growth. Um, they, and, I, and, and sadly, I don't, have, I don't have the counterfactual parallel universe to prove this, but uh, to prove it empirically, but... Um, Poor people would be far, far better off without them. Um, and, uh, and so it, it hurts them by basically giving them the false illusion and letting them live in a fantasy land that is everything is fine, everything's okay, when they could be living in a far better world that requires a lot more of them, but actually provides them with far greater economic well-being. 
a good yeah. intro. Yeah, we can kind of start on those lines. Um, so I guess to talk about some of that stuff, um, what I would say is that um, welfare to me has been proven to be fairly effective at alleviating uh, a great deal of extreme poverty in the world. Um, you mentioned that the thing that alleviates a lot of poverty um, isn't welfare, it's markets, you know, it's economic growth. Um, and to a large degree, I would agree. You know, I'm not a socialist, I'm a capitalist. I think the profit motive and market economics makes a lot of sense. Um, but I think that uh, within reason, though, uh, we can imagine a world that is made better uh, by distributing some of those gains to lower income people who need it uh, to the extent that you're incentivizing innovation um, and to some extent also bolstering innovation. You know, you mentioned that poor people would be much better off uh, without welfare because it uh, tra entraps them to some extent. You know, it allows them to uh, fall into the mindset of, of welfare uh, to where they don't need to innovate. They don't need to to strive. Um, but I would tell you that to me, it's the exact opposite, right? Um, I think that in a lot of countries with pretty robust welfare systems, um, we see the opposite. Um, because after all, it's pretty difficult to work on the next big technological innovation in your garage when you've got hunger and poverty looming over you the entire time, especially when you have to work another job or two in order to meet uh, you know, your needs. Um, rather, I think that, uh, at least in my view, welfare can provide a, uh, a bolstering effect on, on innovation for that reason. Um, you also mentioned that, you know, we don't have a counterfactual. Obviously, we don't have a world where there's no welfare, um, but we did have that world for a long time. You know, for a long time, the government didn't provide very much social welfare. Um, and that was a world with a lot more, uh, let's say, economic precariousness, a lot more poverty than we have today. Now, obviously, you could always ultimately say that the gains in poverty at those times were because of innovation, because of industrialization, because of economic growth. Um, and again, uh, we don't have any disagreements that economic growth can bring people out of poverty. Um, but uh, when we started to see uh, social security uh, and welfare programs come online uh, in response to like the Great Depression, for instance, we saw real increases in people's standard of living. Social security has been one of the most successful anti-poverty programs of all time uh, that the U.S. has implemented uh, themselves. Uh, and I would say that in sort of the broader context of the world, uh, anti-poverty uh, and welfare programs have been shown to give real uh, increases in lower income people's standards of living. Um, and I don't think it's a coincidence that uh, the countries with the most welfare um, or countries that we would perceive as having the most welfare, countries like Norway, Sweden, Iceland, you know, the Nordic countries broadly, um, that those countries also have some of the highest rates of social mobility, um, entrepreneurship, uh, and uh, income mobility in uh, the entire world. I don't, I don't think that that is a coincidence. Wow. Okay. So where do I start? Uh, it's a lot to unpack. And, and it's, it, it, you know, uh, uh, you're working off of um, a lot of uh, kind of mainstream conventional wisdom. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to spend time unpacking the uh, conventional Unpack wisdom. it, Yarn. Yeah, Unpack let's it. go. All right. I, let me just start by saying, uh, so far, we haven't talked about the moral aspects that I led off with. Um, you know, I, I hope we go back to that. Uh, because uh, economics is uh, is interesting, but I don't think ultimately economics moves the world. I think it is morality, and I think that's why we have a welfare state for moral reasons. It has nothing to do with economics. But let me let me address the economic issues that you've raised so far. Let me start with the end. Let me start with the Scandinavian countries. Um, uh, Scandinavian ha countries have uh, high mobility only because uh, the gap between relative poor and relative wealth is small. So if you if you have a distribution that is very narrow, yes, it's easy to move across that distribution uh, very quickly. So it's meaningless to talk about mobility in Scandinavian countries and compare it to mobility in the U.S. What's much more interesting is to look at mobility in a country like the U.S. Uh, uh, pre-welfare uh, state and post-welfare state, and mobility was far higher in the United States uh, before uh, the establishment of any welfare programs, including uh, Social Security in the 1930s, than it was uh, than it was post uh, a free market, a true free market, not relative welfare states, not one welfare state as compared to another. A true free market is the mo most mobile uh, because it is based on ability. It is not based on on um, on uh, uh, you know uh, the factors. It is based on on what you're able to do. 
Um, you talked about uh, the nineteen, the the uh, the pre welfare state uh, world. Well, let's take the pre welfare state world. Uh, in the eighteenth century, seventeenth century, uh, however far back we want to go, uh, basically, if you look at uh, Western Europe and the United States, almost everybody was extremely poor, uh, as defined by the United Nations, two dollars a day or less. The entire population was extremely poor, except for some aristocrats and, and maybe some city dwellers, some merchants in the city. Um, during a period where there was no welfare state for about 150 years, um, extreme poverty was basically, basically as extreme poverty as the UN defined it, eradicated in the West, in Western Europe and the United States. Just take a country like Sweden, uh, which is uh, one of everybody's favorite countries because it has a robust, or used to have a robust welfare state, less so today. Um, Sweden uh, was one of, was the poorest country in Europe in the uh, 1860s, 1870s. 1870, it liberated its economy, basically created the freest economy in Europe, one of the freest in the world, if not the freest at the time. Uh, from 1870 uh, uh, through World War II, uh, uh, Sweden basically grew at some of the fastest economic rates in, uh, in all of history. Basically, it eradicated extreme poverty in Sweden without any welfare. Uh, or with very, very little welfare in the 20s and 30s, uh, but, 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 but almost none. Uh, it then adopted uh, socialist policies of, of massive redistribution of wealth uh, in the 60s and 70s and, and through the 80s. And uh, by 1984, Sweden was basically bankrupt. Since then, it has been reforming its welfare state, shrinking the size of the welfare state. It's still big by U.S. standards. Um, but it's significantly less than what Denmark has, and it's significantly less than what it had in its past. Um, but most of that wealth that was being redistributed during those 60s, 70s, 80s was wealth that had been created during its period of free markets. Sweden went through a period when, um, in the 19th century, early 20th century, it had a significant number of the largest businesses in Europe were based in Sweden. Um, it was entrepreneurial. It was massively innovative. Um, it was, as I said, economic growth was robust. It then uh, got to a point where in the late 1970s, the two biggest industries in Sweden were ABBA, the uh, pop group, and uh, Johan Borg, the, the tennis player. So it had lost its leadership industrial-wise. It had lost its leadership uh, entrepreneur-wise. Uh, today, uh, it, it, entrepreneurship is back in Sweden, not in Denmark, not so much in Norway, not so much in Finland, but certainly in Sweden. And uh, if you look at that, it has very little, if anything, to do uh, with welfare, because the welfare state has actually been shrinking from 1994 to today. But it has everything to do with the fact that Sweden has uh, very, very loose regulations. It's, it's reduced the regulatory burden on businesses significantly, and, and uh, as a result, made it much, much easier to start businesses and be an entrepreneur in Sweden than it had been in the past. Uh, but again, the, the, the real contrast, and uh, again, and, uh, you know, we can use social mobility. I forget the other two parameters that you use for the Scandinavian countries. Um, uh, but generally, if you look at Scandinavians, for example, um, Denmark, Sweden, if they were U.S. states, uh, in terms of GDP per capita adjusted for cost of living, would be well below the average of a U.S. state. They would be closer to uh, some of the poorest states in the South. The United States is significantly richer than on a on a GDP per capita basis um, than uh, Scandinavia is. Americans live in bigger homes, they drive bigger cars, they 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 have more money uh, to spend and to save. Uh, and uh, if if you look at uh, life expectancy, people always bring this up. Uh, life expectancy of Swedes in the U in the United States is about the same as life expectancy of Swedes in Sweden. Um, as is um, all, uh, as are measures of happiness. So um, there's nothing special about Scandinavia. It's a nice place to live relative to what we have today in the world, um, but it's also a pretty dull place to live in a sense that there's little ambition, um, particularly in a place like Denmark or even more so in Norway. Uh, uh, productivity is, is not increased as much as it has in other places, certainly not as much as it could in a free market. Entrepreneurship is nowhere near the potential. Israel is more uh, entrepreneurial than, than, than uh, most Scandinavian countries. Um, there's just nothing to write home about. And then France, of course, which spends on welfare about as much as Scandinavia does, um, you don't get any of the so-called pluses that the Scandinavian countries seem to have. 
Uh, maybe because France is bigger, less homogeneous, and, and is more similar in that sense to the United States. So maybe if you take away some of the factors that make Scandinavia unique, you don't get some of the supposed benefits that everybody sees in Scandinavia. So no, I, I think extreme poverty was eradicated in the West by capitalism, by free markets. The welfare state has basically um, taken all the wealth that was created during that time and spent it uh, and spends much of that wealth. And in the process, it has dramatically slowed economic growth. Uh, poverty in the United States, relative poverty, not absolute poverty, of course, but relative poverty in the United States has not decreased since the 1970s. Um, it, it, uh, it was decreasing uh, fast before the war on poverty started. It continued to decrease in the beginning of the war on poverty and since then has been flat. Poor people in the United States, social mobility in the United States has been hurt, in my view, by the welfare state. Social mobility has shrunk because of the welfare state. Um, and, um, you know, economic growth is pathetic and has been pathetic since uh, the beginning, since the 1970s, since we started this uh, large uh, experiment in massive redistributions of wealth. And we can talk about Social Security. I've spoken for a long time, so let me put aside Social Security. Uh, I, I disagree with you completely about Social Security. I think Social Security has, has been an unmitigated a disaster and is going to be even worse in the future. But it's basically harmed Americans, both because it reduces economic growth and because um, irresponsible people retire on less money. And what, we, what Social Security does I'm just talking about it anyway. What Social Security does is reward irresponsibility and penalize responsibility. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, we can we can hop uh, just kind of point by point there. Um, you know, you talk about the Nordic countries broadly. You know, you mentioned that um, well, the only reason that they have high mobility uh, is because the income inequality in those countries is very, very low. Obviously, what I would say to that is that the income inequality in those countries is very, very low because of the welfare programs that they have, the redistribution, the taxing schemes yeah, that they me, have there. Um, go on. I, I, let yeah. me just point. I don't view income inequality. I, I don't view uh, 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 small income inequality as a good thing. Uh, I, I don't know why income inequality matters one way or the other. It's, it, they have, I agree with you, they have uh, s smaller inequality, less inequality because of the welfare state. But why is that a good thing? Yeah, sure, I can talk about that. Um, but in general, though, I, I don't I don't understand why. Um, th th to me, that 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 doesn't make as much sense, especially relative to the next point that you made, which was that um, mobility before the 1930s, before all this U.S. welfare program came online, was a lot higher. Um, but I could also say that this was because there were a lot more poor people at the time, um, and we were also going through many technological shifts and economic growth that uh, would bring a lot of people out of poverty. Again, we don't disagree that economic growth brings people out of poverty. The disagreement is really uh, what the role of the welfare state is, what the role of the government is into, uh, in terms of providing for its most vulnerable people. Um, to me, that's the disagreement, not necessarily that economic growth can have these changes. Um, yeah, in general, right? Um, you talk about Sweden cutting back their welfare state in general. Um, you know, as a proportion of the economy, Sweden spends about as much today on welfare as it did in the 1980s. Um, and to me, the fact that Sweden has lower incomes on average is not quite as relevant to me as how they take care of their lowest income and most vulnerable people, right? It's uh, much better to be poor in those countries than in our country, the United States. Um, and to me, that is a moral failing of the United States. Um, it appears that these countries uh, can quite effectively take care of lower income people. Um, and all that I would suggest is that we borrow uh, some of their success stories and apply them uh, to our country. Um, if we can uh, eradicate certain forms of extreme poverty, then we should. Now, that's not to say, uh, we talk about the US now, that's not to say that the US has been a complete failure in this regard. Obviously, you mentioned that relative poverty has not decreased uh, in the United States. You know, the poverty line's been relatively flat, seems to hover between 10 and 15% since the war on poverty started. Um, but the problem with this is that it's, it's true, but it's kind of misleading, right? Because the poverty rate, at least the sort of headline rate, um, is just an income, right? That's all that it's measuring, right? It's income. Um, but it doesn't take into account any distributions that are afforded to people on account of the welfare state. And um, the studies that I've seen that actually take into account these income transfer and distribution programs uh, have shown that the poverty rate is actually the, the, the true poverty rate, you know, the, the consumptive poverty rate, the 
uh, you know, how many people have what they need, how many people uh, have the income and the sort of in-kind contributions and, and distributions that they need to survive, that rate on account of the welfare state has gone down precipitously uh, since these programs have been implemented. Um, one study that I found from, uh, I think it was published by the Federal Reserve, found that uh, basically since the war on poverty began, since these poverty programs, uh, these anti-poverty programs started in the early mid-1960s, um, there's a huge disconnect between the official poverty rate and the poverty rate taking into account these income distributions. Official poverty rate uh, as of 2017-18, the end of the study's data, was about 12.3%. But then when you take into account all the distributions that you get on account of being very poor, very vulnerable, it's 2.3%. Um, and so I think that that is very, very positive. Uh, it's decreased precipitously since the 1960s. And the last thing that I would say uh, is that um, I would ask the question, you know, who is going to take care of of vulnerable elderly people, who's going to take care of people with disabilities, people who are unable to work uh, either temporarily or permanently, um, who's going to take care of people who've been made uh, disabled by the state. Uh, you know, we talk about uh, cops, we talk about members of the military, stuff like that. Um, to me, this is uh, the bare minimum case for a pretty uh, generous uh, welfare scheme. Obviously, the uh, free market is free at any time to solve uh, a lot of the poverty that we see today, uh, but the free market chooses not to. Um, and it's because, uh, well, you know, obviously uh, giving a bunch of money to people who are poor isn't a very profitable venture. Uh, and although I call myself a capitalist, um, I would recognize that this is a market failure and it is a societal failure if we don't do anything about it. Well, I, I uh, completely disagree with that. That is, I don't measure the success of anything based on uh, the poorest in society. I'm not a Walzian, and uh, I don't think uh, the standard for measuring economic success or moral success or well-being is how is the poorest in the economy doing. Uh, I think that is a false measure. I, 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 think, it's, uh, I think it's ridiculous um, uh, to, to measure it based on that. Most of us are not good poor. Why not base it on how the, most of us are doing? But I don't think even that is a good measure. I think a good, the best measure of, uh, of, of whether a system is a virtuous system is whether uh, virtuous people do well uh, in such a system. And I think what happens in virtuous here in the context of economics is people who are rational, productive, hardworking, people who want to try to make their life better, people who are ambitious for themselves. And here I think the welfare state is an absolutely unmitigated disaster. I think basically what the welfare state tells a young, poor kid who's going up in the inner city first, it tells them that society doesn't actually care about him. Uh, because they send him to the worst school possible because public education, which I think is part of the welfare state, is an unmitigated disaster. Um, he then uh, it, it grows up in an environment where people are not working, where people are getting checks from the government because the government thinks so little of them that they don't think they can survive through their own effort, through their own entrepreneurial ability, through their own hard work, um, that, that we as a society think so poorly of them that we send them checks to keep them down and to keep them away from us and to keep them to keep them uh, uh, so vile, if you will, and he grows up with that kind of that kind of attitude and that kind of mentality. And if he's ambitious and and wants to do stuff, then he realizes that if he gets a job, um, the marginal income tax rate he uh, he actually pays uh, if he gives up welfare to take a job is through the roof. It's it's over ninety percent. Um, and that everything society is indicating to him, everything the government is telling him, everything, every signal he gets from the people around him is, why work? Why be ambitious? Stay poor. Stay ignorant. Just stay out of our way. And to me, that's what we've done. And, and you can talk about, uh, uh, you know, poverty has gone down to 2 point something percent because of the redistribu redistributive effects. Yes, but those people who survive because of redistribution what kind of life are they living they're living a horrible life they're living a life of dependency a life of entitlement a life that is morally uh, oppressive to them a life of of no ambition and and no work and if we believe i believe at least that much of our self-esteem much of our dignity much of uh much of our self-respect in life comes from work when we deny people work, which I think the welfare does in, in, uh, to a large extent, then we deny them the ability to have all those things, self-esteem, self-respect, 
um, and, and, and the knowledge that they can take care of themselves, the knowledge that they can feed their families, and we deny them all of that. So I think all of that is horrific. I think the welfare state does a horrible, horrible job of treating the poor, and I think it's the poor I'm most concerned about. Of course, I think the welfare state is also immoral in placing a duty on me. Now, what would happen to the poor in a non-welfare state? Well, they'd, they'd work. And they'd work because capitalism, free markets, when you don't tax uh, at, the, at the rates that we've taxed, creates many more jobs uh, than are available. This is why free markets uh, tend to be massive magnets for immigrants, because there's so many jobs. Um, uh, they would get a job, and, and they, their productivity would increase, and their wages would increase with productivity. And no, not only would they ultimately earn far more than they get from the welfare state, but they would also, at the same time, have the respect, the dignity, the self-esteem that comes from knowing that they produced the wealth, they didn't, steal, they didn't take it from somebody else. They weren't just wards of the state and, and actually had the dignity and self-esteem to stand up and be proud of their own life and their own work and their own ability and their own success. That's how I think we eliminated poverty in the West before the welfare state. And what happened that once we established welfare states, starting in Germany in the late 19th century and across the West in the 20th century, is we took that option away from people. And as I said, I don't have the counterfactual other than to say that the developing world, uh, you know, the, the, the countries that have seen the greatest reduction in absolute poverty over the last 40 years don't have welfare states. They have brought people out of poverty through markets. They brought people out of poverty um, without a welfare state, but through economic growth. And that is the right way, the moral way, and the way that benefits poor people the most. Okay, yeah, I get what you're saying there. Um, I guess we can kind of go, uh, again, a little line by line here. Um, I don't think that, number one, I'm not sure if I've, I've heard an adequate response. It sounds like we've moved uh, beyond uh, some of my my talking points to some extent. Um, so obviously when I talk about how, um, you know... Happy to go backwards if I miss something. Yeah, no worries. No worries at all. Um, obviously when I talk about, um, you know, the, the, the real poverty rate doesn't take into account these distributions. And to me, when you take into account those distributions, that shows that the poverty, uh, anti-poverty programs of Western countries have been very successful. Um, to me, you kind of end up going into uh, more of a talk about, well, morally speaking, um, I'm not sure if it makes enough sense to judge a system's efficacy by how much it takes care of the poor, which seems to be implying that at least in a, a in a cash sense, in a benefit sense, these programs do take care of poor people um, in terms of getting them the money and the in-kind benefits they need to consume the things that they want to consume. Um, so it appears we might agree on that to some extent. It seems like what you're saying is, well, even if that's true, though, that's bad because that's not the best way to judge how moral a system is. Um, yes. So I, 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 I take it that we agree that uh, well, the welfare programs are actually effective at getting people the consumption they want or need, but rather we're just disagreeing on, well, is that actually long-term beneficial? You say that the welfare state is a an unmitigated disaster because it tells a person who's poor, you're worthless, you can't survive on your own hard work, and it also tells the same person that um, if he does get a job, uh, that the marginal income tax is over 90%, and you know who the heck cares about working hard if you're going to have to pay all those taxes anyway? Um, and my response to that would be that uh, well, obviously, I just disagree, but um, I think that really what it tells him is that um, he lives in a society which takes care of its most vulnerable people, you know, a, a mutualist society that, can, uh, you know, you can be the richest person on uh, one day, and if you go bankrupt and become the poorest person the next day, you'll have these systems to fall back on, and you'll pay a disproportionately larger percentage into those systems when you've gotten that step up, when you've made it out um, in general. You know, you talk about a you know, marginal income tax rate of 90%, I think obviously you'd recognize you're exaggerating that to some extent. I don't, I don't know of any, uh, frankly, you, of any country that, uh, you know, the marginal income tax is 90%. Uh, maybe that was back in the day that was true, but that was a very small portion of people that paid that. Um, and it's also marginal at the end of the day anyway. Um, it's a progressive tax system, I agree. But what, what were we going to say, Yarn? Uh, you're missing the point. If, if, you, if you're in welfare... You, you get, you get, I don't know, you get X number of dollars um, uh, in welfare benefits. When you start working, you lose that benefit. 
it, that loss is part of that, uh, you know, if, if you, so if you calculate how much you've got net, net of the benefit by working, um, what's left to you is very, very little. So if you take the taxes you pay plus the loss of benefit, the equivalent marginal tax rate is 90%. That's what I meant. And you can see calculations like that on Denmark, Sweden, and in the United States, that uh, the incentive to actually get a job, given that you're losing benefits, is uh, is very, very low. But let me let me address a, a different issue that you just brought up. Yeah, um, sure. No, I, I, I agree with you that, um, that uh, yes, if I give somebody a check, they didn't have that check before, so so they they have more money to cons to to use, you know, to consume. The the real question is from the from the perspective of the well being of of, of people, is is that uh, is that the best way in which um, uh, we can eradicate poverty? And I mentioned the fact that I didn't believe it was that I thought economic growth, free markets, jobs, uh, a far uh, increase in productivity which I think are all um, uh, reduced because of the welfare state. I think those are much better ways, uh, both morally and ultimately economically, uh, than, uh, right. than handing people checks. And, and you can run this, uh, you know, I'm going to make some assumptions that you're going to disagree with, and that's fine. But, but let me just <laughs> okay. run with this for a second. Right? Run with it. Let, let's assume that the welfare state costs us a couple of percentages of economic growth uh, a year because of uh, a reduction in long-term investment, um, which I think is 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 real. So take take a, take a state uh, like the United States today, which is going at uh, at two percent a year, and take the lower the lowest income you can imagine and grow it at two percent a year over the next forty years, and you'll get you know you'll get a, a significant increase in wages over those forty years where somebody is is doing much much better. Um, but it's 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 nothing to write home about. It's it's not dramatic. But then grow the economy at five percent a year, and suddenly there is no poverty. There's not just no absolute poverty, but there is no poverty. Everybody's making, uh, you know, well into the six figures, and everybody's making a great income. So to the extent that the welfare state actually reduces economic growth, which in my view there's no question that it does, um, it is hurting poor people because it's reducing wages. And it is reducing opportunities, and it is, and as poor people, it's hurting all of us. And um, and there's no reason to sacrifice the middle class or the wealthy or anybody for another group. So again, both morally and economically, the welfare state is a drag on the entire economy and the entire world. Sure, sure, yeah. I don't. Uh, again, I, I feel like you keep coming back to the idea that. Uh, you know, the best way to alleviate poverty is is economic growth, you know, market economics. Uh, and I, I don't disagree to some extent, right? Um, I think there was a, a quote attributed to uh, the mayor, former mayor of Detroit, who once said that uh, there's there's no problem that a good paying job can't fix, right? And, and obviously, I agree with him um, that if someone who had a, a terrible job um, or who had no job gets a good paying job, uh, there's quite a few problems in that person's life that are solved. Um, however, obviously, what we would have to quibble over is, well, how do we get those jobs, right? And I think that the government plays a really strong role in not only encouraging economic, uh, uh, what do you call it, economic growth, innovation, investment, um, but also providing uh, for those people who are stuck in those vulnerable circumstances for one reason or another. For instance, there was a uh, there there was a uh, a big report that came out about the people of Bangladesh. Bangladesh right now is going through a pretty big industrial, you could call it an industrial revolution, basically an economic awakening, which is built partly on the back of market economics. They're specializing, right? They're basically becoming the, uh, the, the textile manufacturer of all of South Asia and greater Asia and the world. Um, and that's caused them to be per capita wealthier than Pakistan for the first time, I think, in their country's history, um, so ever since they uh, broke off uh, from Pakistan, right? However, what this survey also showed was that um, a lot of the poverty that was associated with the people of Bangladesh was based purely on a lack of capital. And when exogenously there was an increase in the amount of capital that they had available to them, uh, whether it came from the private market or from government incentives or from international grants, that that 
in and of itself was able to end the cycle of poverty that many, many millions of these people found themselves in. So giving people that initial help, in, you know, that, that, that one-time injection or that continuous injection of cash into their pockets or in-kind benefits into their pockets is very, very crucial uh, at alleviating the worst effects of poverty and getting rid of uh, that, 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 uh, that cycle of poverty that seems to affect so many generations. Um, and when you talk about uh, the last thing that I'll mention is that uh, a point that I couldn't get to uh, before you jumped in was that um, you, you mentioned that, uh, you know, without the welfare state, people would get better jobs, they would stand up, they'd be proud. Um, you mentioned it seemingly, uh, again, just now, if we didn't have the welfare state, basically, people would just get better jobs, incomes would go up, um, and you wouldn't need the welfare state. Um, I think the problem with this is that it's ahistorical. You know, again, for hundreds of years, we didn't have a, wel a welfare state. Um, and although a lot of people got out of poverty based purely on mostly market mechanics, uh, sort of, you know, incomes going up, industrialization, um, you, you know, innovation over time. Um, we didn't alleviate, el eliminate poverty in the West. Obviously, you referenced the poverty rate earlier. Um, so you know that that's not true. We still had a lot of poverty before uh, the welfare state. Um, and uh, so I, I, I don't agree. Uh, however, when you look at poverty rates after we, uh, what do you call it, implemented the welfare state, They've gone down when you actually take into account those benefits. I just, you know, I don't agree. I think that people are much better off with a welfare state, and uh, I don't think it hurts economic growth. I mean, you know, you talk about, uh, the last thing I'll mention here is that, you know, you mentioned, yeah. um, well, I'll just the last thing I'll mention is that yeah. um, you mentioned, you know, the countries with, uh, the countries that are growing the most, that are getting rid of the most poverty right now are countries with very, very little welfare. You know, you talk about China, or you didn't mention any countries, but you could talk about China. Uh, you could talk about uh, you know, maybe Singapore as an example, the Asian Tigers, stuff like that. Um, those are all countries with a huge amount of government involvement in the economy. And the Asian Tigers specifically have a, an incredibly large amount of welfare. Um, for God's sakes, in Singapore, they have uh, decommodified housing to, to a great extent. Uh, you can barely buy a car in Singapore. So, you know, all these countries are success stories, um, partially on the back of good uh, government policy and stewardship of the economy. Although, of course, I <laughs> wouldn't advocate anyone go and live in, uh, in China anytime soon, but you get what I'm saying. Yeah, so uh, a number of things. You're equivocating here on a lot of different things, and, and that's wrong. So uh, capital is not the same as welfare. Uh, yes, uh, uh, any poor country can benefit enormously from capital invested in that country. That is ultimately the way in which you eradicate poverty, is to bring capital into a place like uh, Bangladesh. That is exactly what's happening with the textile revolution and other revolutions that are happening there. Uh, that is the appropriate way to eradicate capital, uh, to eradicate poverty, and that's not something the government does. That's something the private sector does. The government can do it; it just does it uh, much less effectively. And in order to get that capital, it has to tax capital, it has to tax investment, it has to tax the wealthy, and therefore, by doing that, it's actually reducing investment and reducing capital that goes to uh, to to uh, create the jobs that alleviate the poverty in in places like. So you can't equivocate between giving somebody a check as welfare. And between producing uh, capital that actually is going uh, it, it, to produce real jobs. Um, you're also equivocating between uh, absolute poverty and relative poverty. Um, and when you talk about uh, extreme poverty, uh, that's absolute poverty. Extreme poverty is something that does not exist. Or if it does exist, is, 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 is so minor as to be irrelevant. Uh, in the United States and in Western Europe, there is no extreme poverty. Uh, not uh, $2 a day or less. Nobody in the United States, maybe a few homeless people, live on $2 a day or less um, in the United States. Not with welfare, not without welfare. Um, it just it just doesn't exist, and it hasn't existed uh, for a long, long time. Relative poverty is always relative poverty. Relative to poverty is just a bell curve, and you're deciding that uh, that randomly some uh, below some number is going to be uh, poverty, and I'm sure... That if everybody in the United States today was earning an income of, of six figures, um, everything else held constant, somebody would define uh, people as relatively poor in spite of the fact that we're all relatively rich. So again, you can't equivocate between relative poverty and absolute poverty. There are two different concepts. And the fact is that before capitalism, capitalism is a new thing. It's about, 100, it's about uh, 200 years old. Um, before capitalism, everybody was absolutely extremely poor. And capitalism, without any welfare state and without and with very little government involvement, government basically involved in the protection of individual rights, primarily property rights, but that's it. 
um, actually raised people out of absolute poverty. Yes, some people stayed relatively poor, but even that relative poverty, uh, based on some number that somebody in the government defined in the Social Security Administration in the 1960s, even that number was declining before the welfare state in the United States was established, was declining precipitously before the welfare state was, was established, and continues to, to continue to decline afterwards if you include uh, re redistribution, as you mentioned. Um, okay, big deal. Uh, I, I could easily argue, and I think, I think this would be true, that um, if we hadn't established a welfare state in the 1960s in the United States, then uh, the poverty rate as defined by the Social Security Administration in the United States today would be cl even closer to zero than what you claim it is today. Um, but, you know, uh, it, it's hard for me to prove that because, as I said, I don't have a parallel universe in which that's run. Um, but the fact is that the only way that you have been able, that you can reduce, um, uh, that you reduce this relative poverty uh, is by taking capital take, or taking wealth from some people and giving it to others. Uh, and this is the other equivocation you make. Of course, the welfare state reduces economic growth because where, where does economic growth come from? Economic growth comes from investment. It comes from entrepreneurship. That's where economic growth comes from. Um, and what do you do with the welfare state? Uh, two things. One is you take um, money away from people who tend to invest it, not to consume it, to reduce long-term investment in the economy by uh, taxing that money away from them. And secondly, uh, you reduce the pool of entrepreneurs because, again, you incentivize poor people not to become entrepreneurs. Um, I don't know anybody um, who started, I know very few people who started, uh, uh, you know, started uh, uh, companies um, in, uh, in Silicon Valley coming out off of welfare. Now, it's true. Uh, there are other things that uh, suppress uh, poor people's entrepreneurship. Um, uh, licensing laws are horrific, uh, and they, they, they victimize the poor more than anything else. Uh, uh, various zoning laws, the restrictability within uh, uh, poor communities to start businesses are incredibly destructive to poor people. Uh, uh, all kinds of uh, fees and taxes placed on small businesses as they start are incredibly destructive to poor people. We have in the United States, sadly, uh, very, very destructive policies uh, in, in terms of the ability of ambitious poor people to be successful in their lives. Now, with regard to uh, people who might still not be able to be successful in a free market, with regard to people who might still be poor in spite of all the job, created, in spite, uh, job creation, in spite of the economic growth that is created by free market, well, then whoever cares about poor people has every ability uh, to help them. That is, there's nothing in a free market, in a non-welfare state free market, that prohibits people from helping uh, poor people out in whatever way they want. And indeed, uh, in, in the, before there was a welfare state in the United States, there was a robust system of private uh, charity and, and, uh, and private insurance. Insur you could buy insurance against poverty. It was quite robust, quite effective, uh, and I think was a, partially a, and, and rewarded people for actually doing the things that would actually get them on their feet again versus, again, the welfare state, which provides the worst kind of perverse incentives uh, to, to uh, keep people in poverty rather than allow them to escape it. Okay, yeah. Um, so I guess to talk a little bit more about Bangladesh and the example thereof. Um, I would disagree with how you frame that. So I would say that welfare can absolutely be capital injections, right? I mean, after all, the, you know, the trials in Bangladesh were talking about giving people things like cows or chickens, whatnot. You know, this can be welfare, right? I mean, you know, giving Michael, someone a cow is okay. not... Don't yeah, go on, Yarn. Micro lending is not welfare. I mean, it's very confusing if you're going to use those kind of those. Kind of, welfare is a, a check from the government. Welfare is food stamps. Welfare is a direct assistant. Um, well, but yeah, but I, give, giving how giving someone a cow versus giving someone an EBT card. The cows I mean, are what? being by by nonprofits. The cows are being given to them by charities, and the cows are being given to them by micro lending organizations that are not government welfare programs and well wait wait wait. but but no no but the point of that but the point of referencing that is not the point of referencing that is not to say that 
you know, this this is a credit onto the Bangladeshi government. The point of referencing that was to say that obviously when you give people money or you give people some amount of capital, and in, in this case we're talking about you know, basically feedstock and stuff like that, um, that that can result in a reduction in the cyclical poverty that might be, you know, ailing those communities, right? Um, whether it comes from private companies no, it or it comes from the government, um, the experiment shows that when you do that, it's it's positive. So, I mean, that's it, that's the I point mean, of, of, mean, of referencing that. There's been an experiment with UBI in Finland, and it doesn't show it doesn't show that. But but let me just let me just point this out. Well, you, well, money, UBI yeah. is not something I'm advocating for. To be fair, money, yeah. But, Finland, but it, Finland's it, also a very wealthy country, so it's, it is obviously you know, there's, there's 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 a marginal trade off here. There's a there's a marginal uh, benefit and, and cost here. Point. If if the money is given to the farmer and the farmer or or to the poor person and the poor person uses that money to consume, then that is not capital. The cow is capital. Uh, I agree with you. Stock seed is capital. Um, money given to the person to start a business is capital. That there's a huge difference between money just handed to a person, which is what the welfare state does. It's handed for them for them to consume versus for them to invest and produce. Well, and let me ask a question. Let me ask a question. If if the U.S. if the U.S. said, "Hey, instead of an earned income tax credit, we're going to give you, you know, we're going to give you five grand a year to invest in the stock market," would you call that welfare? In the stock market, God, well, you're in, you're in, you're buying businesses. You're you're a you're a business owner when you're a stock owner. Kind of. That's a it's a it's a it's a much more complicated question. But if you said if you gave people five thousand dollars to start their own business, uh, five thousand dollars to invest in a business locally that that they could get cash flows from, um, I would say uh, I would much favor that type of quote welfare program. Than I would a welfare program that just well, gave them. Yeah, yeah, price. sure. I mean, and again, I, I started out this. I started out this conversation by saying, you know, we we have to define what welfare means. And you know, when I when the government is taxing or taking on a deficit to give people directly capital or cash um, that they can either do what they want with or has strings attached to in the form of EBT or you know in kind benefits like you know like example giving them directly just giving them food or giving them cows or giving them assets or whatever that they can work on. I would define all that as welfare, right? Um, but yeah, apparently I, I we have some oh, some differences think, in, in definition it here. Misses, it misses very important differences. The fact is that no so-called wealth, no welfare state uh, in Western Europe and the United States gives people money in order to start businesses or get a cow where they can produce milk from. Uh, it, you know, it's really, really important that what these all these systems give people is cash and that is a big difference it's a big difference uh, it, it 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 you know and and uh, it, it's why i don't consider bangladesh a welfare state whereas i do consider sweden a welfare state so well, but if, uh, if just if just cash and if just cash transfers is what you're calling welfare i mean would you call would you call like a single would you call a health a healthcare system that's subsidized by the state you don't you wouldn't consider that welfare i consider that welfare but again what i don't consider welfare is uh, although I, I, I st I'm still against it, but I, I yeah, think sure. Would, wait, what I don't consider welfare is, for example, uh, the government acting as a venture capitalist. That's not welfare, right? The government making investment in businesses or the government giving individuals money in order to start, like the small, um, what do you call it? The uh, small business administration, uh, SBA loans. SBA loans are not welfare, even though they're on very, very good terms and they, you know, they, they, they're they not on market terms. But it's not welfare in the same sense as, me guarantee you a certain income that you're going to spend on consumption. It, it's, yeah, sure. It's a, I, I, I understand. It's a, yeah, I under it, it provides different incentives, and, and it's wrong. I would much, I, you know, if, if you said here two systems, one, we go into poor neighbors, we get everybody cash on an annual basis or food stamps or whatever, or um, we provide them with seed capital to start a business. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'd be much more likely to support the seed capital than to give them a check. I'm against the government doing either one of them, but of the two, the seed capital is by far superior to just handing them over, not just a check, but often the welfare state limits what the person can do with the money to consumption. So, for example, food stamps is money that is given to people in a sense that they can only buy food with rather than um, you know plant a garden from which they can take food. So it, it, it's the, the whole way in which the welfare state provides disincentives for people to invest, to produce, to work, to create, 
It reduces, um, uh, as I said, it reduces ambition and it reduces happiness. It reduces success. It reduces. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're 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 going on a, a bit of a tangent there. All that I would say is that the purpose of bringing up the Bangladesh example was just to say that uh, the government can play a role in providing people either capital or, in my view, benefits uh, so that they can achieve their initial consumption that they need today, they need the next week, and that they can therefore have more disposable and discretionary income that they can use for other purposes, whether it be entrepreneurship or whether it be simply uh, paying off debts or whatever it might be. I don't think that that's an unreasonable role of the government. Um, obviously, you also mentioned that uh, sort of an add-on to this is that the government um, you know, doesn't, basically the government can in theory, invest in capital that you know gives people uh, that it gives people, but the government can't do that very efficiently relative to the market. But I think that what I would uh, disagree with is that um, the government can actually invest in capital to such an extent that you have net asset creation that is not wealth destroying. Um, obviously, when we've got uh, scenarios where the government invests in human capital, especially in many developing countries, it seems to be very positive, uh, especially for the economy when the government invests in things like education or health systems whatever it might be. Um, to go on to your other points that you mentioned uh, you know, before we got off on this uh, talking about capital is that um, you mentioned that um, extreme poverty basically doesn't exist in the West. Um, you mentioned that obviously when it comes to extreme poverty, it depends on how you define it. Um, but I mean, I'm not really changing my definition of extreme poverty over time. If we look at the relatively consistent ways that we've defined extreme poverty over time um, and how we've measured it across time, those measurements show that uh, welfare makes poor people wealthier. It makes them, uh, to me, live better lives overall, right? Um, you can also say that uh, you know, capitalism is what alleviated a lot of extreme poverty. Um, I don't disagree. Again, you know, I'm a capitalist. I think that, uh, again, good paying jobs, economic growth, that is the thing that uh, reduces a lot of poverty. It's more about the role of the state in terms of helping people along the way that aren't necessarily helped by the market, which brings me to uh, your last point, which was that um, you kind of, uh, you ended up bringing up, you know, what about people who can't work or are still at the end of the day disadvantaged by the market mechanisms surrounding them without welfare. Um, and you mentioned that, well, obviously working people can help those people however they want. Um, and uh, again, I, I would just, you know, pose the thought that um, today, uh, all people who are living in relative poverty, all people who are homeless, uh, let's say, you know, we, I imagine we'd agree to some extent that homeless people are living in uh, living pretty rough, let's say, um, you know, those people uh, are free to be helped by the market at any time. And the market certainly has the wealth to help those people. Um, but they don't, right? They don't for one reason or another. Private charity um, and private donations uh, simply doesn't have the direction uh, and magnitude that can help in such a deep way uh, to help those people as broadly subsidized social welfare programs. And many countries uh, do a lot better taking care of homeless people um, than we do here in America. And I think that it's important to learn from those models because those models models don't seem to, in any significant degree, sacrifice their standard of living in order to take care of those people. And that's what I would advocate for. All right. A few things. Uh, one, you're not a capitalist. Uh, I believe things, uh, you know, you're like I am, Yaron. Oh, no, I'm a capitalist. You're not. You're not. How do you define Capital capitalism? Capitalism means something. Capitalism is a system in which the government does not interfere in the economy, period. Does not. That's not you. Wait, wait, hold on. Well, Yaron, can I ask a question? Sure. We live in a mixed economy. <laughs> um, we live in a mixed economy today. We have elements of capitalism. We have elements of redistribution of socialism. We have elements of, of call it fascism, which is which, which what I call the regulatory state. I've we got to ask a, a question, Yarn. Can I ask a, a question? Sure. Ask a question. Uh, so, so is your opinion that, I mean, genuinely, is this your opinion? Is your opinion that capitalism is when the government doesn't do stuff? Is that your opinion? My opinion is uh, capital. No, not at all. I think the government has to do stuff. It, the question is what stuff. My opinion is um, that capitalism is that system which the government only does uh, what I think it's supposed to do, which is protect our rights. That is, protect property rights in in the economic context, protect individual rights more broadly, have a police force, a military, and a in a justice system. But it has zero involvement in the econ in, in the economy. So uh, that is what capitalism is. Capitalism um, is when the government doesn't do economic stuff. That's right. Right. All right. I disagree. I don't know. I, I don't. I don't think that sounds like a contemporary definition of capitalism. I, I think that. So yeah, if, go on. If free markets. What are the what are the markets supposed to be free of? 
Yeah, mark, market to me, capitalism is is market mechanisms, private investment, uh, the profit motive, uh, you know, some combination of those three things. Yeah, but all of those uh, have have heavily uh, heavy interventions from the government. All of those are uh, manipulated and completely distorted by government policy. So it's not pure capitalism in any kind of sense. It's a mixed economy with capitalist elements. All the things you mentioned are capitalist elements. But we've got massive government involvement in every aspect of the economy. So, uh, you know, it, it loses meaning to say that, um, uh, you know, the U.S. today is a capitalist economy because then what's the difference between the U.S. today and the U.S. 100 years ago? Is it more capitalist, less capitalist? What, what does it even mean? It, it, you know, so... Uh, well, there's, we more, there's more redistribution, uh, sure. We're not, we're not capitalist anymore. We, we are a state... Oh, I disagree. We, the state, you know, when the government is spending 40 plus percent of GDP, we are no longer, uh, which it does if you include uh, state and local government, we are no longer a capitalist economy. So, okay, so it, that's my first point. Second point, uh, look, I don't think the government has any role in the economy. I don't think it does any good in the economy. I don't believe that China and the Asian tigers got rich because of government intervention. I think they got rich in spite of government intervention. And I can go through any one of those countries and show you how that happened. Indeed, the best example of this, of, of a country that got rich without government intervention, uh, is Hong Kong, where there's almost no government intervention and got just as rich as all those other countries uh, with a lot more difficult circumstances. Um, so, no, I, I don't think the, the government has had any positive uh, role, even though um, it's not to say that any particular investment didn't turn out. A lot of its investments have had uh, a positive wealth creation. But in total, relative to having left that wealth in private hands, um, there's no doubt in my mind that we suffer from lower economic growth and less innovation and less prosperity because the government has become such a big part of our economy and invests so much. Um, so uh, so uh, I think we're net much worse off because of the government has taken on a role. And I think that's true of the Asian tigers and certainly true. And, and China is learning, going to learn that the hard way. Certainly true of China. Uh, China, uh, China, all the growth in China is from those sectors of the economy where the government, uh, um, you know, basically was hands off. And as the government is becoming more hands on right now, you'll see dramatic uh, economic shifts in China and a reduction in economic growth. Um, well, I sure. don't not, think not, neither of us are central planners. We 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 can agree on that. Even the even the, the piece of the government that does central planning today, whether it's a Federal Reserve or whether it's uh, uh, you know uh, investment in different areas, I think is ultimately uh, economically destructive. Um, I don't think welfare people live better lives. So so you say uh, they get more money, they live better lives. I think the alternative in which they don't get that money. Uh, even if that means that for a while they are poor, I think their lives are better in those circumstances. And um, some of us live worse life because we have to pay a lot of taxes in order to make their lives a little better. Why am I a sacrificial oh, animal? On. Why is it okay to use coercion on come me? Come on, Yaren. No, no, I'm serious. I'm absolutely serious. Uh, you, 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 think, say, you think you live a significant... Well, I just, I just want to answer the question. I want to ask the question. You, you, you think that people like Bill Gates and Warren, you think they live significantly worse lives? When I lived in California, 50% oh, of my from me, 50% uh, at the margin was taken from me. 50 well, hey, as, 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 a, as a proud Texan, I'd never advocate for living in California, Yarn. I mean, you got to, you know, okay. we agree on that. Let me, let me end by the point on charity, which I think, again, is, is so deceptive. Um, first of all, why do we have so many homeless people? I mean, I, we're not going to get in a whole debate on that. But we have a large homeless population in the United States because of government policies. Um, in a free market, you would not have anywhere close to the number of homeless people you have today in America. You'd have far, far, far less. Um, it is because of the welfare state as a whole, in, in primarily housing policy, of our governments and, uh, and local governments and federal governments that has caused, uh, that has caused the crisis in uh, homelessness in the United States. And by the way, somebody who travels all over the world... Uh, homelessness is a problem in other countries as well. They deal with it a little differently. They hide it better. Uh, but, you know, if you go walk around downtown Paris, and, and France, by the way, spends... I know you love to talk... Uh, I mean, redistributionist status love to talk about Scandinavia. But France spends about as much as Scandinavia does on welfare. If you walk around Paris, there are lots of homeless people in Paris. 
Uh, and it's interesting, it, France has never brought up, but uh, so I think homeless is a, is a problem of uh, government policy and the solution to it is not more welfare, but less government intervention and primarily in housing. Um, but what about charity today? Yeah, of course, charity is lower today. I am a, a lot less charitable when 50% of my income is taken by the government than I would be if none of the money was taken by the government. I'm far less charitable when I am told, Siri, shut up, uh, when I'm told by the government that they're taking care of it, don't worry, we've got this. Um, but again, uh, in a free market, uh, charity uh, would, be, would be substantial, but I think more importantly, it would be effective. It would be like what's going on in, um, in Bangladesh. It would be much more involved in uh, providing the cow than in providing cash for consumption. It would be much more involved in making sure the kids get an, a good education than the rotten public schools that we have today. It would be much more incentive um, you know, adjusted to make sure to provide poor people with the right kind of incentives and not to destroy those incentives. So I'm a huge believer in public charity, in private charity, but um, you, you know, uh, uh, government uh, crowds yeah. out Private capital always does everywhere it enters, everywhere it goes. Uh, private uh, private enterprise doesn't go because government crowds it out. Yeah, I, I you know I, we can talk about France uh, a little bit here. Um, I agree that France uh, does spend a pretty good amount on well a lot of stuff. I mean they have a pretty broad and expansive welfare state, much like most of northern and western Europe. But really, I guess Europe broadly and developed countries broadly. Um, and but I don't necessarily disagree with that. All that I would say is that I would advocate for models that appear to work, and I wouldn't advocate for models that don't appear to work, right? Obviously, there are some welfare states that... differences between Sweden and Denmark in terms of the amount of money they spend on social spending. Yeah, I think in terms of public social spending... Yeah, go on, Yarn. What would you say? Less than Denmark, more than Sweden. Right, right, yeah. And so I, I'm not... I would never take the position that more money on welfare broadly means, you know, less poverty, right? It, it just depends on how you spend it, right? I mean, obviously, I have critiques of the U.S. Uh, social spending that they do on welfare as well that could be made more efficient in my view. Um, but it's not to say that, you know, uh, because... What, what do you call it? Because some models work better than others, we should throw away all the models. Uh, no, I mean, we just... Again, we advocate for models that work and we don't advocate for ones that don't work. Uh, just because you spend more on... Uh, social welfare doesn't mean you necessarily get those same benefits. It's obviously going to depend on how you spend it, right? Um, now, I'm not deeply familiar with the French model of how they, you know, take care of homeless people or what the context is behind all those people being homeless. But obviously, I would assume that uh, clearly something's going wrong if they're spending a shitload on trying to house homeless people and you still got a bunch of people living on the street. Or maybe there's, uh, for instance, uh, some people, you know, um, maybe a lot of people migrated to France and they're not eligible for those benefits. So those are the people that are homeless. I mean, who knows what the context is. Um, now, when we talk about charities taking up the gap left by a world where we no longer have government welfare, um, I don't know. I feel like there's a lot of empirical data that would lead to some, well, frankly, the opposite conclusions, right? We've had tax cuts before, um, and it doesn't seem like whenever we've had pretty big tax cuts, we've seen proportional increases in the amount of money that goes towards private charities. It seems like where that money ends up going oftentimes is disproportionately into wealthy people's savings accounts or into corporate treasuries. Um, and I don't know if that's the most productive use of spending on a societal level, um, at least relative to what we could do with that money should we tax it and spend it on programs that could uh, redistribute that income uh, to homeless people or disabled people or whatever, you know, what have you, what context it would be that you would spend that money on. Um, and so, that's happened over the course of history. Um, and again, uh, I do agree that, you know, when you look at the phases of industrialization, technological shifts, economic growth before the welfare state, obviously, you're going to see pretty big decreases in poverty. Um, but we still had a massive amount of poverty, even though we did have a lot of wealthy people and upper income people who could have theoretically taken care of those homeless people. And there's many, many wealthy people today um, and upper income people today who are able to take care of homeless people in the form of social welfare and charity if they were able to do so. The reason I pick homelessness is because by all accounts, homelessness is a pretty shockingly affordable problem to solve. Um, and it would only take uh, a few billion dollars of aggregate investment a year to substantially reduce the number of people uh, experiencing homelessness. But, you know, the market doesn't make those investments, right? All that I'm saying, like my whole point is that 
I just don't think that the market necessarily is incentivized to take care of those people. I think that as a government, uh, collectively democratically accountable government, you are incentivized to take care of those people. You keep saying that, well, I feel like I just, you know, I just think that, of course, it's the case that uh, welfare necessarily reduces economic growth. I feel like I've given a case where it could actually increase economic growth, lead to more innovation. Empirically, it seems to be the case that it does. Um, when it comes to economic growth being decreased by welfare, I'm not sure it's substantial. I'm not sure it's demonstrable. Uh, and I think it overall just leads to a, a net better life uh, for many of those people who are involved. And last thing that I'll say is that uh, we're coming up on the hour mark, Yarn. I'll give you the last statement, but I'd love to, after you're done talking, responding to me, I'd love to throw it to the audience for some questions. Yeah. Uh, so a few things. Um, I highly recommend a book that uh, my, my friend and co-author, who's co-authored animal books with me, Don Watkins, wrote. Uh, I think it's called Roosevelt Care. Roosevelt Care. Um, uh, off of Medicare, uh, but with Roosevelt first, uh, that's available on Amazon. Uh, and I think the, sh the the book will show convincingly uh, that pre uh, uh, pre the Great Great uh, Depression, uh, there was robust charity in the United States, the robust institutions to take care of the poor and to help the poor, uh, in spite of the fact that the country overall was much poorer than it is today. Uh, the, the whole mentality of freedom, which I think we had uh, in the pre Great Depression era, the whole mentality of not expecting the government to take care of things. Um, you know, the world was a different world and, and, uh, and people behave very differently. And, uh, and there was a very, very, very robust, uh, system of, uh, safety net that was completely private and not, nothing to do with government investment. Um, I find it interesting that you claim not to be a central planner, but yet you sound exactly like a central planner. You ask the question, you, you say, well, I don't know if, um, if, uh, rich people putting their money in a saving account is the best use of their money. Why is it any of your business what rich people do with their money? It's none of your business, indeed. Only a central planner thinks in those terms. Ooh, how can I take all the money that people put in their savings account and do something better with it? It's not your money. Take your greedy hands off of it, right? It's my money. I get to decide what to do with it. Now, as an economist, I can tell you that by far the best thing to be done with that money is to put it in a saving account and therefore fuel future uh, economic growth. That's how economies grow, is, is uh, through investment. Uh, so, uh, yes, uh, you can do these empirical studies by small marginal changes in the tax code and see if charity goes up. Yeah, I'm, I'm not surprised you're not seeing anything there because the whole mentality has shifted in this country to the point where poor people are going to be taking care of the government. We wealthy people don't have to worry about that because we're paying it in our taxes. And don't worry about charity. In spite of that, Americans are the most charitable people in the world. Uh, Americans give more charity than any other country in the world. Maybe because at least until recently, we were also among the freest people in the world. Um, and then you made a point about homelessness. Homelessness cannot be cured by a few billion dollars. That is bizarre and absolutely wrong. Indeed, as the state of California is proving every single day, the more money you throw at homelessness, the bigger problem it becomes. Homelessness needs a structural shift, a structural change. It primarily needs a shift in housing. And indeed, the more free housing you give homeless people, the more homeless people there are. It's basic economic 101. If you give something, if you give something out for free, demand for that thing will increase. Um, we've got a, 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 the, the problem of, of, of homelessness is a mental health problem, which America has had since the 1980s when we changed the way we deal with mental health. Um, and the second is, it's a massive housing problem. We do not build enough houses in the United States. We're short about 10 million units of housing in the U.S. And that is a problem of zoning, of government control, of capital allocation, of immigration, not allowing enough immigrants to come in to actually build those houses, um, and, and, and a bunch of different things. Money does not solve homelessness. California that spends the most money on homelessness has the biggest problem. All right. Well, in the in the spirit of closing statements, I will not respond to any of that. And I'll go straight to audience questions. Uh, I'll keep you for about 20, 25 minutes talking to the audience. Um, then we can be on our way, uh, Yarn. Uh, the first question from Exponent. What line of GDP spending makes a country socialist? Well, I don't know. Uh, I don't know that I define uh, countries based on, on, on socialist um, 
I mean, socialism means technically that the government owns the means of production or, 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 or uh, you know, has ownership over the means of production in one way or another. I don't believe America's socialist. I don't believe America's capitalist. I don't think those are the only two options. I think America and most countries, all, all countries in the world, almost all countries in the world, are mixed economies. Some countries lean more towards fascism. Some countries lean more towards socialism. I think a country like... Um, uh, you know, Cuba and North Korea are probably more socialist, communist. A country like China is probably more fascist. And most of Western Europe and most of the United States is a countries that are mixed economies leaning towards fascism. Um, mm-hmm. and, and fascism, I say, because fascism is a system in which people, uh, we pretend that people have private property, but we regulate it so much that it's meaningless to call it private property. So I think America and Europe are far more fascist than they are socialist. Because the government doesn't control the means of production, at least yeah. it doesn't own the means of production. It does control them. And that's, I think, the difference between socialism and fascism, whether they own it or whether they control it. Yeah, I guess for me, my response to that question would be that, um, to me, socialism is when you have collective ownership of the means of production. Collective, like Yarn said, could mean government. Uh, it could mean a you know, mix of cooperatives and government ownership could just be cooperatives. Um and uh, to me, that would make a country socialist. Um, to me, I, I, I'm comfortable calling pretty much the whole entire world uh, capitalist countries for the most part, uh, except for the obvious examples of like North Korea or something like that. Capitalists, I think China falls into a fascist economic model, although it appears Yarn and I disagree on what fascism means. Um, but to me, capitalism is when you have uh, you know, p- private ownership of the means of production mixed with the profit motive, market economics. And to, and to me, for the most part, that's what America has. The way that I would define fascism and, and the reason that fascist economics is a little hard to define is because it's kind of a um, kind of a liquid term depending on who uses it. But um, at least the, the, the most reasonable definition of fascist economics is a system by which the government uh, conspires or co-ops corporate uh, investment and development um, to, in order to achieve state means. Um, and uh, that isn't really capitalism. It's also not really socialism. Um, and that's kind of what I would put, uh, that's kind of the, the, the category that I would put countries like China in um, and uh, like Nazi Germany, for instance. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't disagree with that. I think, I think that's, uh, we're very close in terms of the definition of fascism. And that's why I think we agree that China is more fascist than, than socialist or capitalist. All right. Um, let's see. Lyra for four ninety nine. Thanks for the donation. My friend got a government grant to go to college for free. He improved his life and income through this. In your opinion, is this number one welfare? Number two, is this immoral? Yes, absolutely, it's immoral. You know, I I know people who have um, who have uh, you know stolen money from other people, and it's improved their lives uh, materially, at least. Uh, I know people who have committed fraud, and it's improved their their life um, uh, materially. The fact that somebody's life materially improves does not make the action moral. Uh, the fact is that your friend went to college at somebody else's expense. And I don't blame him for that, because we live in a system where that is how you go to college. But a system that promotes redistribution of wealth to benefit some at the expense of others is a fundamentally immoral system. Well, wait, but but you said if the government were to give you money to invest in a business, you would be more okay with that. And I feel like the government giving you money to invest in your education, I mean, isn't that a, would, isn't that a good use of government money? More okay with it. That doesn't mean I'd be okay. You're more with okay. It. You're more okay with college education, but but it's still a uh, you you would still college. say you're not. Yeah. It yeah. Would okay. Be less, I see. It wouldn't. It would still be immoral. I see. I see. Um, Yaren, have you ever been poor? Well, what do you mean by poor? Uh, yes, in the sense that I came to the United States as an immigrant with no money. Uh, I, I, uh, I had uh, two children uh, were born um, while I was a student uh, making, what was I making in those days? About $15,000 a year. Um, and, uh, you know, with two kids and a wife who couldn't work because she was in a H, what was it, uh, F, F2 visa, which didn't allow her to work. Only I could work and I could only work on campus. And so, yeah, I mean, for six years when I was uh, a student, um, I would say by any definition, uh, economic definition, I was poor. Now, I didn't consider myself poor in a sense that I was, get, I, I was a student. I was getting educated. I was improving my life. I was living a good life. I can't complain about the life that I lived. I couldn't go out. 
I didn't go to see the movies. I didn't go to restaurants. I didn't do stuff like that because I couldn't afford it. My largest expense on a monthly basis was diapers. Um, but in spite of that, we lived a good life and the prospects for the future were good because I was getting an education. But I was poor by any technical measure. And I think you'll find that many of the 2% that you consider poor are students. And, and therefore, I'm not sure that that's the kind of poverty you actually want to eradicate. Well, hey, I think whether you're poor as a student or poor as an adult, I think, you know, being poor sucks, right? <laughs> and so uh, some okay. welfare programs, to me, make some sense. What were you going to say, Yarn? Sorry. And I got no, I got no welfare. Um, you know, you could argue that, I, you know, because I was an immigrant, so I got no welfare. Um, I think my health care may be being subsidized a little bit by uh, the university I was studying at. Certainly my education was subsidized uh, by the state of Texas. Um, but other than that, um, I got, I received no welfare. I received no state assistance. And, um, I think I did quite well for myself. So, uh, you know, being poor does not suck it being, it depends what you do with it. And it depends how poor you are. And it depends. Again, I had two kids making 15,000 bucks a month, a year. Um, only I could work. My wife couldn't work. I don't know if you get people a lot poorer than that. And yet, I can't say those years sucked at all. Those were some of the best years I've had. Well, I don't know. It sounds like they would have been made a lot worse if you didn't have the government helping you out with your education, though, right? Uh, if I didn't have the government ma uh, helping me out with education, then I would have found a different different uh, solution, and I would have been fine. I would have been fine. All right. So, uh, well, I, I, came, I came to the United States with enough money to pay for out-of-state tuition at the University of Texas for a semester. And I figured I'd, I'd figure it out when I got to the U.S. And I did. And I think, and I think that the, we underestimate uh, what people are capable of doing. We underestimate what people uh, can do. We overestimate uh, the dollar sign. And we underestimate, you know, because, again, I was poor. And I don't consider my life bad. But, but some people who are poor have a rough life. It, it, a lot of it has to do with the attitude you bring to poverty. And a lot of it has to do with whether you think you're on the way up or on the way down. And uh, I would like to see a free market where people, ambitious people, can strive uh, and, and be as ambitious as they want and not be penalized for that. And I think that requires the elimination of the welfare state. All righty. Well, there you go. I guess that's where we would disagree. I, I think that uh, if anything penalizes you for being poor, it's, uh, you know, being poor, right? Um, but obviously we... They stay poor. They stay poor because in the I welfare see, state incentivizes them to stay poor. All right, Yarn. What's your solution to climate change? What would you What would you envision? <laughs> Whoa, left field. Um, what's my solution to climate change? I mean, it's um, uh, go the Israeli route. To invest in desalinization plants. Oh, uh, certainly. Uh, desalination plants is one. I would say. Uh, uh, cheap energy is another, so uh, nuclear nuclear power, uh, more fossil fuel burning, if that's the cheapest form of energy, building dikes, where sea, uh, reclaiming land from the ocean where uh, uh, sea levels might be rising, um, uh, you know, expanding air conditioning to uh, places that might have not needed it in the past. So they well, needed wait, wait, would you do this climate, with... Uh, you know, well, what's going to happen? Exactly. Well, would you do this with government coercion or would you want the, would you just expect the market to do it or what? Private, private individuals in the market uh, can do it. You, you could imagine that communities might want to come together, for example, to build dikes or things like that. Um, uh, but uh, those things are relatively cheap in, in, with modern technology, if you compare it to what it cost when they built the dikes in, um, in the Netherlands. Uh, I think all the solutions to climate change um, uh, you know, uh, can be done on a voluntary basis uh, by free people without the use of government coercion. All right, last question, Yarn. What is Yarn's plan for prisons? Will they be structured by markets too, privatized? How do you do prisons in your ideal society, Yarn? I think pr prisons are part of the justice system. They're part of uh, the police and the and the uh, uh, you know uh, legal system, and therefore I think they should be run by the state. Um, and they should be part of, uh, again, uh, very little should be run by the state, basically uh, policing uh, and, and, and uh, judicial, which I think prison is part of that, 
and then uh, and the military uh but but that's about it the state could be would be uh you know before uh before uh, the beginnings of the office state and the great depression government spending uh, outside of periods of war uh on a, on a on a state local and federal level combined um you know did not exceed five percent of gdp i i think we could easily go back to less than five percent of gdp uh, total government spending and the amount of wealth that would be created in the united states and the amount of poverty alleviation that would happen in the united states would truly stun you econ boy as well as i think your audience uh, it would be an unbelievable um uh, economic engine that we would create in this country if government shrunk to what it really should be all right well there we go that was the last question obviously i uh disagree although i i think we agree that some regulations are dumb you mentioned some of the housing regulations i mean zoning laws and stuff like that certainly should be scaled back licensing laws hopefully yeah you're, you're yeah people people talk about occupational licensing i mean i think you should probably get some sort of a license to be a doctor or you know something more technical but i mean i don't see why you need a license to be a you know cutting hair that seems a little <laughs> ridiculous to me but um but hey you know things you wouldn't need as much welfare because a lot of people would get jobs so um there you go so we can agree some regulations are bad for sure um well all right yarn i mean to my audience got about oh i don't know f uh, 50 60 people watching shout yourself out what do you want them to check out where would you point them to oh yes uh you're um and uh just check check my youtube channel Yaron brook and of course uh if you want to dig a little deeper check out ayn rand uh at the shrug the fountainhead and ayn rand.org a-y-n-r-a-n-d.org and again my youtube channel you can uh, you can find a ton of content on there there we go people well thanks yarn for talking to me have a good rest of your weekend what, what time is over in puerto rico right now i assume it's uh not too different east coast time Eastern time. That's what I figured. Yeah, people forget uh, that. Uh, what do you call it? Time zones go vertically, so it's it's not that uh, you know Canada and all those guys about the same time as it is here. But all right, well, have a good time, Yarn. Thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. Invitation. Thanks for having me on. No problem. See ya.